Welcome to Subject to Change, a sustainability podcast. Hello, Hello. sir. Hello. <laughs> it's nice it's, to meet you. Well, it's nice to meet you as well. How are you all? Good. Joining us is Jeff Kaufman, Shantyman. So oh, I'm, I'm curious to know what you want to talk about. I know, right? <laughs> we, <laughs> we tend to throw people into the deep end on these because we've talked to around 50 people so far and... <laughs> The joy of every conversation has been in, in seeing where the conversation is going to go. And uh, sometimes Lauren knows a lot about the person we're speaking with. Sometimes I know a lot. Sometimes neither of us knows anything. <laughs> Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. When you see the little microphone in the lower right, click on that to learn more. We're so glad you're here. We could start with uh, talking about sea music and shanties. And then maybe the experiences that you've and the things that you've had to do over the last year, because there have been a lot of changes in that world, at least in Southeastern Connecticut. Yeah. And then we can find out what you want to talk about, okay. or we can find out what you want to talk about first. Well, um, I will want to get to the fact that before I arrived at Mystic Seaport, I was very involved with the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater. And, oh, yay. And What's that? I don't know what it is. It, it is a 106 foot long sailing sloop that's also 106 feet tall. And it was built by Pete Seeger and friends as a, a flagship to sail up and down the Hudson to promote the idea of cleaning up the Hudson and waters around the world, in fact. And uh, it began with a crew coming out of Maine. Uh, wow of singers on board as crew members people that really knew what they were doing like like gordon bach who is a you know incredible incredible sailor and incredible singer um and they did concerts in different ports along the way to raise money as they came down and then uh that grew into a group of people called the sloop singers but first right after i had done my 35th um, year at Mystic Seaport and had coordinated, had directed my 25th festival, Sea Music Festival. Um, I handed the reins of the event over to A.J. Wright mm -hmm. and was prepared, and I did retire from Mystic Seaport at that point, two weeks after that event. Um, unfortunately, COVID came in and AJ and 95% of the staff were not just laid off, they were fired outright. And the attitude of the incoming administration was that the festival that we had run for 40 years uh, was really uh, not significant enough to carry on in mm -hmm. that form. Let's learn a little bit about Mystic Seaport Museum. And I, I just want to say, okay, this is this is catching Lauren up and catching our viewers up a little bit. Mystic Seaport Museum is a, I, I'm going to say in, in brief, it's a foundational uh, experiential museum about the history at a certain time, mostly of life on the sea and has several ships and uh, displays how to set the sails, how to cook over an open hearth how to be a shipwright and actually do ironwork for the ships and ships carving, all the things that are related um, and has been in Mystic, Connecticut. I remember my mom telling me that she used to play on one of the ships before it was restored the first time. So this was in the, in the 40s and 50s, the Charles W. Morgan. So that's one piece of this. And then the Sea Music Festival, give us a sense of of the reach of this, the 40 years of the Sea Music Festival. What kind of music, what kind of countries have been represented? The reach of the Sea Music Festival. It really had the reputation of being the greatest festival of its kind, of it, and particularly as an annual event um, in the world. We were aware that there were incredible singers, particularly in France, and uh, that was the first contact we had about 1986. And we brought a wonderful uh, sextet uh, of men from France called Cabestan, which is capstan in French. And people's jaws just dropped 
when they heard that group. Uh, and wonderful. then that group invited me over as a consultant for a festival in Pampol in France the next summer. Uh, the year after that, I went with my trio, Forbitter, um, actually a quartet, but Dave Littlefield wasn't flying with us at the time. Oh, no. And <laughs> for the next 15 years, we went to major festivals in France. But all that time, the Sea Music Festival in uh, at Mystic Seaport Museum was considered to be the prime feather to put in your cap. And so we brought people from France, obviously, from England, from Poland, which is a curious story in itself, uh, uh, from Germany, uh, particularly from Europe, but also from Australia. And uh, then also, as we had the chance, we brought people out of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And when I, I must say that uh, the year that I got to Mystic Seaport, uh, Craig Edwards also arrived a few months after me, and we became uh, very devoted to the idea of looking at the African influence on the music of sailors, and we began to look for the people that represented that. Searching for source singers. <clears throat> we were looking for source singers, and we were lucky that uh, we were able to find people like the Menhaden Shantymen, first group that we yeah. brought from Beaufort, North Carolina, and uh, then the Northern Neck Shantymen later on from Virginia, and from uh, Barely St. Vincent in the Grenadines, we brought the Barely Whalers. We brought men who actually sang as they rode boats to go out and hunt for blackfish for pilot whales. It's amazing. Uh, so we were actually bringing uh, these groups and exposing our audience to where where these songs came from in a lot of ways. It's really about the representation. The sailing history is actually the most diverse industry in, in really in the world. It, it, in in whaling times, uh, the crews were were what every every corporation today strives to be as far as as representing cultures and embracing and and the mix and was astounding and the music reflected that as well lauren is kind of reeling who knew and oh, i cut lauren off go for i it. know my mind is just blown right now i so i was telling jody before you joined us because we we spoke with the ballard of the erie canal um is another first um, interview when we started this, I was totally unaware that there was so much music that surrounds water or has to do with water. And it makes sense, like in retrospect, like every everybody needs it. Life comes from it, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm how how did anyone come to establish that this was like a historic, a historic thing that everybody did and that it was so widespread. And how is there so many of us inland apparently that know nothing about it? Shanties have even impacted movies and TikTok. <laughs> well, and that's changed over COVID. Let me just say that one of the things that I've been inspired by is there's a movie that came out called Fisherman's Friend a little while ago. <laughs> and there are Zoom activated shanty sings I, I attended one, I think it's it's held out of Michigan. Well, just for Lauren's uh, benefit also, uh, the TikTok got onto this. Yeah. And there's now a shanty talk element on TikTok. Come on. These are, these are people, people who do their one minute bits of shanties, um, you know, for TikTok. And it's just, it's it's quite the craze. <laughs> There's a shanty on, on about cats that really went crazy for a while. I think I got it from three different yeah. people. Right. right. <laughs> I am so out of touch. I'm not even on TikTok to see these things. <laughs> and, and Jeff and I are the gray hairs here. You should be up to snuff on this stuff, Lauren. I really need to pick it up. Fisherman's friend. First of all, it's important to know that the men involved in that singing are life-saving crew right, right. From, from that town in port in uh, in cornwall and they 
it's a little hard for us to know, but uh, my trio ended up uh, there in the before they were known, let us say. Yeah. And I think that we might have inspired them to focus more on their shanty repertoire. Oh, yeah. And uh, they they went on from there and have sung for the queen, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Uh, but it is, it's quite a phenomenon. And what I think is significant about it is the, it was the, the uh, festival at Mystic Seaport was founded by Stuart Frank, who first went, probably went to the seaport from Yale, uh, brought a couple of friends of his and twisted the arm of the administration to start doing demonstrations on the ships and start using the music that was used at the demonstrations, at the actual work. That became the focus of his push to create a festival to celebrate that. And they were able to bring to that festival a man by the name of Stan Hugel from mm -hmm. England who had published the the greatest volume they call it the bible uh, the shant of shanties um, but stan hugel put together the greatest number of those shanties uh, in a publication that was published i think in 1960. he wow. had sailed on square riggers he the, he was a great raconteur incredible character and um, and he really knew what he was talking about so he Fantastic. inspired my generation of shanty singers mm -hmm. you know what i think was significant for me was that we at mystic seaport became the place mm -hmm. where on a daily basis even in the winter we would be singing these songs but in the spring summer and fall we would demonstrate this music on board ship showing how it was actually used at sea and to make those direct connections between this sung tradition and the lives of the people that were right. doing it songs that sustain culture yep. that when you're talking about sustainability i think one of the <laughs> important things with traditional music across the board there are all kinds of you know different genres of traditional music that do this but they are keeping alive uh, a sense of the culture of the people from which it came the ballads which tell stories and then these work songs, which actually illuminate the actual, the lives of the people that were doing the work. Mm. Yeah, that's key about shanties, which um, which I think is it makes it really dynamic. They're used to pace the work. They tell a story, but they're also a tool yeah. and not just a tool for communication, but a tool for the work. And so the the, the ballads and the, the songs, the Forbitter songs, right? Those songs are, our storytelling and they keep alive the memory of being on shore when you're at sea and the memory of being at sea when you're on shore yeah. but the the work songs have another layer to it and right. and i think it's reflected the the way we can understand it most if we're if we're not connected to the sea is probably through through work songs in the field that are sometimes depicted in stories of slave labor right well, um, exactly and yeah that the the connection between that and the shanty tradition, the more we've looked and the more people have researched it, the more it becomes clear that these songs came from that black population, mm. that the earliest versions of these songs were being used for pushing cotton into ships. And there were rhythmic songs being sung by black men in southern ports wow. uh, to to do that work. Those songs were then being picked up by particularly Irish sailors who were listening to this music saying, dang, that's a good tune. Uh, oh, hey, that's a cool phrase. And then actually the black men themselves as freed blacks or as slaves being on board ship using these songs to get work done. We can approach it as a tribute. So I want to ask kind of a, a question that just occurred to me, had nothing to do with anything that's gone on until this moment. When you were talking about, um, and this is a struggle of the modern age, I think, when you were talking about the fact that the shanties came from from the slave slave labor and bringing cotton to the ports. So here's the thing. Are we, what do you think is, is the 
purpose of maintaining those songs and stories reflected against that really negative origin story. Mm. Uh, I would say that the first thing is to um, to use that body of music as a tribute to yeah, the people yeah. that created it and their musicality and the fact that they had such an incredible effect on uh, not only shanties, which is, you know, from Lauren's point of view, a new thing. Uh, <laughs> but how about? It's just blues? new to me. I recognize it's yeah, not new. <laughs> you're, 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 you know, it's with a fair. lot of people out there. Uh, but what about the blues? Right. What about jazz? Mm -hmm. What about the impact that all of that has had in terms of music in the world? And then you begin to start to think of South African music mm -hmm. and this music that's coming from all over the place that now, uh, in fact, pop American singers have gotten onto and incorporated into their music, their body of music. There are important questions to ask. There is also a very important question here. Mm -hmm. What am I doing as a white man singing mm -hmm. that repertoire? It's a great is question. it valid for me to do that? That's that's an important question to ask. And it's very much, I think, my answer to it is very much the how you're doing it, how you're presenting the music. Are you putting it all in the context? Half of what I do when I perform is to storytell about the song I'm singing. Uh, when I sing songs from the Menhaden Shantyman or the Barely Wailers, I tell where that's coming from, why I feel it's significant, and why I find that music so compelling, mm. because there's there there's just amazing melodies, amazing rhythm, an amazing story behind any one of those songs. Someone who's maybe far away, where can we hear? Like someone from Syracuse. Your, your car, yeah, like some like no one here, of course. Um, <laughs> your quartet. You can go to my website, which has some CDs on it available. Okay. But now there's a different tack. <laughs> now, now, do you still sing with Forbidor? Um, I mean, it's Rick Spencer, you, Craig Edwards, and David Littlefield, right? No, we, we haven't been singing as a quartet for quite a long time. Yeah. Uh, I am currently singing with Dave Littlefield and uh, Joseph Morneau as a new group called Different Tack. Oh, nice. So we're going to start showing up on the scene as a, as a trio. That's awesome. We do continue to sing with Craig whenever... Uh, we have the chance because we have a, a repertoire that we both love and we really love singing it together. Since I've stepped aside from Mystic Seaport Museum, I've really turned my focus back to that repertoire that came out of the Clearwater. That's so great. Let's hear more about the Clearwater. Okay, so let's talk about the Clearwater, but then let's, then let's come around again and pick up the story of Mystic Seaport. I want your reflections on that because I, I'm quite astounded at that at that change. And I, I know I'm not the only one. And I know you've been you've been, I would say, processing that change over the last what, 10 months or more, whenever it was yeah. decided. So Clearwater. I live in Albany, New York. The Hudson River is less than three miles from my house. I have been on the clear water, sailed on it with my son and my best friend and her daughter. I did not know the history of song related to clear water other than Pete Seeger. Of course, there has been for a lot of years an annual festival, uh, the Clearwater Revival. And we would all, like 35 of us together from different places, would gather and sing with Pete at that festival. That's so cool. Uh, when the Clearwater started, a lot of sewage effluent, for instance, mm. was getting piped right into the Hudson. And not only did we did Pete create this incredible flagship, uh, which had a beautiful starburst on the mainsail. And, you know, you don't it's it's an amazing thing to see a vessel of that size sailing down the river with that mm -hmm. image on its sail. When they began, they not only had this ship, but they had people getting in 
canoes and yeah. small boats and going up and down the shoreline, finding a pipe and tracing it back to the source and, and taking that person to court. Ooh. And that had an incredible effect on getting people, getting towns to put in whole sewage facilities to stop all of that raw material going into the river. Isn't it amazing how we just awesome. dump things into the ocean, figuring it's the ocean is so big, it will never impact the ocean. And, and that's what's also key. The Hudson River is ocean yeah, up until ocean, Troy, yeah. New York. Right. Lauren, 163 Lauren. miles from- No, I'm, I'm like, I'm yeah. just fascinated by this whole thing like you're hitting me with all kinds of facts i'm like what watch yeah. the the clear water efforts changed the river to the point of that that solid waste problem was largely solved by clear waters mm -hmm. stepping in and making an issue of it yeah. uh, there are still other issues that uh, the river deals with but the river is so much cleaner than it was uh, well the pcbs out of yeah. uh uh, yeah. Schenectady and North are exactly. still still a huge issue, but but it's interesting. We've uh, we're almost more accepting of that pollutant because we can't see it. Yeah, so I that's see. something I struggle with. It's hard to communicate to people that we need to continue to clean our rivers and pay attention. Just yeah. because you can't see something doesn't make it benign. And now Jeff is going to sing for his supper. Even all the years that I was head of shanties at Mystic Seaport, I was I was going off and doing somewhere around 250 gigs a year, somewhere around the United States. And many of them were environmentally focused. Um, so it's been a, wow. a really important part of my uh, my career. Hmm. And uh, you, di you did, by the way, hint that I might sing something. Yes, yes, I, we Would definitely... You? We would be so honored if you would sing for well, us. Let's um, let me do a song that that uh, I brought to Clearwater from Bob Zentz uh, from Norfolk, Virginia, uh, and uh, it just seemed to to speak to the mission of Clearwater. And I just have my guitar back here. I, that's very slick. <laughs> so this is called "This Old Earth." Fragments of another sunset Ashes of another dawn Drowned in time's immortal ocean All too soon we may be gone This old earth has seen a lot of living This old earth story she could tell This old earth is finished with a giving This old earth we used so well And now the playground stands deserted in the yellow afternoon and the cotton candy children have all gone home too soon and the tree of knowledge trembles for the truth was ours before from the garden door. So what will it take from nature? And what must it take from man for the future generations to save the sky, the sea, the land? This old earth has seen a lot of living This old earth, the stories she could tell This old earth is finished with a giving The 
this old earth we used so well. So we who use the earth must answer. Who's to lose and who's to win? And while we're watching where we're going, we must see where we have been. Endangered species and pollution, the dross, the rubble of the dream. And while we all look for solutions, Remember, we all live downstream. So ask a child what really matters. Ask your friends what they will do. Ask the leaders you've elected. But it really lies with you. This old earth has seen a lot of living. This old earth we've used from end to end. This old earth is finished with giving. This old earth could use a friend. Ah. That's a beautiful, beautiful, heart-wrenching song. Yeah. You brought that with you from your Clearwater experience. About what year do you think that song was written in? Um, well, probably just a couple of years after the first Earth Day. Probably. Yeah. It was probably written in, 19, I believe, 1972. Diddly squat. Okay. So this is the, the, a couple of things I, I, I took from listening. <laughs> Excuse me. Is, is, of course, the recognition that 50 years later, we've done diddly squat, <laughs> right? So, and both Lauren and I are, are, are working very hard in our own industries and our own efforts. And, and, and I like that that song talks about all the way, all the people that need to be involved, but that ultimately is a, per, a personal engagement. Yeah. Then the other thing I took from it <clears throat> is... Um, is that uh, there's so much, but but I think I think that the understanding of the importance of of resources and resources is a bad word, but of systems like water systems and the systems of soil and the systems of air comes from the people who are most intimate with them, and so that's what sea music of all types has always meant to me, and and I think that one of the things that I try and do is help people reconnect to those systems in some way. Mm -hmm. And boy, shanty singing and <laughs> ballad singing of songs of the sea. What a wonderful way to start that connection. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. Overfishing. If you look at, uh, uh, the history of our, uh, our shoreline uh, treatment of, of resources, we were overfishing from oh, yeah. very soon after we got here. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, I will say that at Mystic Seaport at that festival, I did institute a um, having one workshop every year that dealt with environmental music. And oh. one of the people that, uh, that came was Jim Payne from Newfoundland and Newfoundland is a particularly poignant um, story in terms of all of this because, of course, the Grand Banks of Newfoundland have been the source of fish for, from, for Europe for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. Uh, people, once, once they found those fish there, um, in fact, when I talk about whaling, I talk about the Basques going from the Bay of Biscay, finding their way to Greenland to hunt for the Greenland whale as it became known. But they were also fishing yeah. and they were fishing on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. And they were followed by everybody in Europe figuring out 
that, hey, this is the place to go for fish. It's a big uh, shelf. And yeah. at that big shelf, there's a congregation of fish. And it's been, it, it, it was so crowded. I remember some of the stories that we had to learn in order to talk about things at Mystic Seaport. But one of the stories was about ships actually being out there fishing. You would think that there's plenty of room in the sea, but they actually would crash into each other right. on, on the Grand Banks because it was that busy. Yeah. Oh, wow. So there are there are very powerful songs about that element of the death and destruction that happened in those storms when one vessel would break loose yeah. from its anchor or have to cut loose from its anchor and would run somebody else down. And uh, the song like the ghostly fisherman that, yes. that you know, the crew mm -hmm. goes goes out and these ghostly figures come up on deck because they in their vessel had run down a vessel a year before and those figures show up on their vessel. Yeah. Wow. Just, I mean, these, those ballads are just, you know. We're dependent on the fisheries. Jim Payne <laughs> yes. from Newfoundland uh, comes to Mystic Seaport and he brings with him a song called Where Do the Capelin Go? And if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind singing that one. Perfect. I'm, I'm uh, pleased. <laughs> because here is, uh, here's a great example of contemporary songwriters taking, and you know, obviously uh, Gordon Lightfoot's telling of that story of the Edmund Fitzgerald is another example of this, but contemporary songwriters looking at what is going on, what is happening, mm. and putting that history into song so that in fact that gets carried on. And so someone like me, um, now probably 30 years after Jim Payne brought this song to Mystic Seaport, I'm still singing this song to try to convince people to understand what is going on in the fisheries of the world. Wow. And what a great way to communicate. So yes, please. <laughs> Where do the capelin go after leaving their bodies washed up on the beach from bird fish and net trying to stay out of reach if we could but learn what these silver schools teach about trying to survive in the ocean while we try to live on the shore where do the codfish go that once filled the depths of the bountiful sea, took with it livelihoods precious and free, vanished into the jaws of technology? How can they survive in the ocean when we take the last one ashore? Where do the whales go when the capelin and codfish are caught in the chase? What in the water will take their place? Or will all sea creatures have to give up the race of trying to survive in the ocean when we take the last one ashore? Where do the fishermen go when there's not enough fish left to feed families fed our forefathers for five centuries now life by the waters a fond memory of when fish survived in the ocean and we used to live on the shore so this just reinforces jody our direction into veganism egging each other on it does absolutely that's a we, we thank you for that song yes it's amazing thank you. we um we interviewed someone a couple of months ago now that challenged us both with understanding the relationship, uh, the environmental burden and the cruelty burden of eating, um, <laughs> eating flesh. Yeah. And so we've been egging each other on. That's a bad expression in this case <laughs> to, to try and, and 
to try and move to a plant-based diet. So mm-hmm. we're making small strides in that regard. And mm-hmm. it's really kind of amazing, but I love the way also in that story, it built the relationships, the connections, but it's not just fish, right? I, that's amazing. And one of my most incredible stories that I read about systems thinking and also thinking, teaching us that we don't know how mother nature works all the time is um, a story about how when Japan was trying to maintain whaling, they said, we're maintaining the whaling so that there'll be more fish for the fishermen to catch. And in reality, when they stopped as much as they have stopped whaling, um, the whale populations grew and the fish populations grew because the whales actually churn the ocean and allow the nutrients to get to the surface so that they can get sunlight. So they're there for the fish to eat so the fish can grow in population. So it's all an incredibly complex delicate system nutrients yeah one of one of the uh recent things that i've come across is a a uh, parsing the fact that uh, krill in the southern ocean uh, are not at the volume that they ought to be because there are so few whales compared to what used to be there and it's um it's actually the nutrients that are coming from whales. Yes, yes. <laughs> after they've eaten krill, that uh, that keeps that whole cycle going. And as you know, just all of these things are so connected. And but we have to realize how connected we are right. to all of that yeah. too. I mean, right. we we really uh, ignore at our peril this natural balance that we have so desperately upset and Mm. you know if we don't pay better attention soon Mm. it's it's we who will well we are paying the price we are paying the price yeah yeah we're just not recognizing Uh, global warming i'm gonna say you know that's my term for it uh, is is having an incredible impact on so many people and it's it's driving tremendous populations to migrate Mm -hmm. and it's just it's creating you know, it's going to create more desperation as time goes on. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. What's the deal, Mystic Seaport Museum? And I, I do want to say that the the communication of song, I think, is is a is is a power that we need to employ more. Yeah. Which is which is why I'm going to say I'm I'm. I was so stunned as a as a member of Mystic Seaport Museum that there was a turning away from the music. I don't know, and um, and and I I kind of asked the question during the shanty sing, but I, I don't know the story. Are shanty men now not part of Mystic Seaport Museum, or was it relegated to turning their back on the met, on the festival? So far, no shanty singer has been hung has been hired back as a shanty singer it's crazy and so it seems that um and i you know i do know that some small demonstrations are going on but i don't think there's any move toward doing the kinds of demonstrations we were doing of hauling sales and such um it was you know it was a devastating thing to have the entire shanty staff uh, fired mm-hmm. and to have no indication that that is going to be reinstated anytime soon. Right. Uh, and the hmm. very specific uh, comments of the new administration regarding the festival and its nature um, drove uh, a number of us to create a committee to move the festival somewhere else. And so we yes. will, in fact, be holding uh, the Connecticut Sea Music Festival in Essex uh, on the same weekend that it would have been uh, at the seaport. June 11th and 12th, 2022. And so on June 11, 12, uh, we will be carrying on in Essex. And I have to say, we had a, a committee meeting last night, and I am just so blown away by the amount of work of course you know we're talking about 
having to create the infrastructure of a festival where a lot of that existed at Mystic Seaport in ways where we could just tap into it and use it in some ways. Here, we're having to create it in from whole cloth. And the amount of work that's going into that is just phenomenal. But it's very, you know, well, the fact is that I had, uh, my role for a lot of years had been to uh, gather together the people who would continue to support the festival financially and it would not have gone on without the Friends of the Festival. Mm. Uh, the money that came in through Friends of the Festival was what allowed us to be in the black year to year and mm -hmm. for the museum to allow it to continue because the, the museum really put no money into it. It did, uh, you know, th th the structure of the, of the museum being there, we were using uh, mm -hmm. it. And so that overhead was, was their input. But... Uh, no financial support was given. So those those people who had carried it on for all the for a lot of years mm -hmm. um, were up in arms mm. and were quite upset. And uh, very Shock. quickly, very quickly uh, made it clear that they wanted to support having this event somewhere else. Sea shanties on a river. Right, you're not quite in the shadow of Gillette's Castle and the Goodspeed <laughs> Opera quite, House, but... <laughs> that area. Yeah, it's a pretty vibrant area. Um, does it change things for the festival that it's on a river instead of on yeah. the shore? Of course. I mean, yeah. we can't do what we had done on board ship, and um, to me, that was the such a significant part of the festival, and and it was what I took to Europe every time I went. We are carrying on probably one of the most important parts of the festival has been the symposium that existed for all the years that the festival went on. So 40 years of symposium as well. And we have a wonderful list of people that have submitted symposium papers. Some are going to be That's done great. in person and some are going to be done virtually. So we're actually going to work this out. We can do both of those at the same time on the Friday. We have included a scholarly element. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that are digging deep into different pieces of this traditional music and bringing that to us. And it's people like that that have shown us how connected this is to the cotton stowing shanties that ended up getting, you know, inspiring other work on board ship. So the uh, the fact that we are carrying on that symposium to me is a very, very important part of what we're doing. It's a new world. That's that's marvelous. The research aspect, the history. I'm I'm still I'm still playing over my every time I've been at the seaport and I can't imagine being there without music. <laughs> yeah. So that's I'm coming to terms with that. Lauren, what do you think of, of this world that's been open to you? I mean, I am definitely going to go online and I want to actually hear some additional songs. Like I, and I want that context of like the, the history. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a good way for me to navigate this as a single you know, person online researching this for the first time, like where is there like a, is there a reputable source I can go, should I just go to your website? Does it have the history on there? Seriously? No, it doesn't. Um, my website doesn't have that per se. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, there, there are lots of performers who are mm -hmm. um, kind of central to this to this effort to keep this music as, uh, alive. And, you know, we're bringing a set of them for the festival in June. You should just come with me, Lauren. Well, I know, and I'm actually interested in the symposium part of it because like, to me, that's like the, a the academic side of it is the fascinating side of it to me. Okay. So, great. I mean, the, I'm sure that the, the music is also amazing, but I, I'm really interested like in the history and how it came about in the roots, like you were saying earlier. 
Well, it's also really cool. Even in this little group, we, um, Jeff, I got John Roberts name and I met him at one of the pub sings and I contacted him to see if he would be part of a uh, subject to change chat. And he didn't have the time or wasn't comfortable or didn't feel confident in his singing. I don't remember what his reason was, but he connected us with George Ward in the same interview with George talked to a gentleman named David Borton, who is developing solar electric canal boats Ooh. for the water systems and to haul cargo because solar electric is so much more efficient for hauling cargo. So, so the music itself has this woven history <laughs> that goes in and out and who knows how to find where it came from and where it's going. And even just having the freedom to explore the music today does the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I think is sustainability because if you're not doing this, then you're not resilient, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I'm probably not supposed to say this, but I'm I'm just really mad at the Mystic Seaport Museum that <laughs> now if I ever go, there's not going to be any music, <laughs> and I'm going to be mad about it. You should be. Well, yeah, we'll we'll see what they we'll see if anything changes over time. Um, well, to be fair, COVID was what drove them to to making this right. gr initial grand leap. It doesn't sound like they did a good job of it at all, and then to rely to, to bank on that as being their future state isn't really understanding that Mystic Seaport got traffic and got attention from that Sea Music Festival that benefited that organization in a huge manner. And they're losing that, that, that reciprocity is gone. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear a work song. I, I know that we're, we're, rap, we're coming close to our hour. We, yeah. I, I have a I have a question, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Is there a, a fairly short work shanty that you could sing for us before we get into our final questions? Sure. Um, well, you know, I, my my favorites of these are um, are coming from those resources we talked about. So, Menhaden Shantyman, uh, those might be a little long, but the Barely Whalers, for instance. Um, for a rowing song, uh, would use something very simple and and very quick, and um, they and 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 it really works well in a whaleboat. I have to tell you, we've we've exercised it a number of times, and uh, but they're talking about it, the this song is Blackbird Get Up, and then White Bird. So there's a White Bird and a Black Bird in this. Uh, the sense is that they're talking both about the, the blackbird might be the blackfish, the pilot whale. And one of the images that they have uh, is of a, of a blackfish coming out of the water. And just, you know, so that, and it's dancing on its tail, essentially. Ooh. But then the, but we're also talking about the women back home. When they get, when they get back with the catch, which for them, was divided uh, on shore by the people that came down to help get the, the blackfish up on the beach. Um, then they would, then everybody was sharing the goods and then they would of course party. And uh, you can imagine that, that they know how to do that in Burley, St. Vincent. But this is the song that they would sing to row. So, blackbird get up, hiya. And she break a tail, hi -ya. White bird get up, hi -ya. And she do the same, hi -ya. Oh, Madonna, hi -ya. Emelina girl, hi -ya. Oh, Madonna, hi -ya. Girl, come home with me, hi -ya. And it goes on and on. <laughs> that's what's great about the work songs right it's yeah. they're they're simple everyone can contribute to them uh, very quick to learn and creative song leaders or shanty men yeah. could could add verses forever and a day if needed <laughs> and these guys would have to wait would have to row for hours to get yeah. out to where the the quarry was and then row for hours bringing it back and the stories, we, we interviewed them at one point 
uh, and their stories were incredible. They would do uh, improvisational theatricals uh, where they would each take parts and and they would do that for an hour. You know, it's just it's incredible. Phenomenal. It's really about singing together. And just the music is always so enlightening to me. And so, and when I say enlightening, I mean, it informs me, but it also lightens me. When, when I would go to the pub sings with my knitting and just chant along in the choruses when I knew, knew what to do, I would sit there for four hours with a, uh, nursing a beer or two and, and just feel so community tied. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thrilled that the festival is going to happen this year in its new form in a new place and with a lot of the same faces and maybe inviting new faces. Yeah. So thank you for all of that. Yeah. Well, one of the great things about this tradition is the, the simple joy of, of singing mm. and singing in company with a bunch of people uh, is just a phenomenal experience. And so whenever we have the chance to do it again in person, um, wherever it might be, yes. uh, I, I urge both of you to go and sing with everybody. Yeah, it's so much fun. Yeah, uh, Lauren looks a little scared. I mean, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to, I'm going to get there, Jeff, absolutely. And I'm trying, I, I put the March date for the fundraiser on my calendar. I have to work that out still, but okay. um, we'll see how that goes. But the, wonderful. Congratulations to your whole team too. Um, we will make sure, say the not-for-profit name, say the organization name. The, the bigger name is uh, Maritime Music and Traditions Society. Okay. And if you look that up, you'll come to a website. And eventually I would say to Lauren that that website will begin to accumulate uh, information and we will begin to put the history of this music in some form in links and and whatever on that website so i think that's going to be so cool like that that to me is it's so interesting like to see how how these intersect so who is this shanty men's hero we end every interview with a couple of questions and our first question is Who's your hero? Is there somebody that we could learn from, be inspired by, that has uh, inspired you in your life? People of your generation uh, don't know Pete Seeger, but uh, he, he's worth looking up to because he was a phenomenal figure uh, through uh, his 96 years of living. Right, wow. right. His he incredible didn't... wife, Toshi. Yes, yes. <laughs> I actually used... Um, you know, if I had a hammer yeah. and song in a presentation I gave at work the other day. It's amazing how music that is so foundational ends up in places and you don't actually know where it came from, but it, that's how inspiring it is. I like, see, I love doing this because one of the things that I do after we talk is, I, so I take notes, you probably can't see, but they're like front and back, I've got notes. And I go through and I find like, I go find all the links and I like dig into it and I start to, to, to kind of follow up on, on some of the things that were discussed. So I'm excited. I, I definitely will be looking all of this up. Yeah, great. And we, uh, we put those in the description of the video when we post it too, so that everyone has access. What is the focus that we should all turn to? Go do you want it. me to do it? Yes, always. <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> I fumble over this question, so. So the way I like to ask this question is, if you could push a pause button right now and get everyone to focus on one cause or initiative that you feel would improve our lives, what would that one initiative be if we all collectively focused on it? Mm, an excellent question. Uh, because you could answer that by kind of focusing on a very large issue like climate change, as people are talking of it now. But I just came off a, uh, a webinar from the NRDC about fossil fuel uh, 
about dirty fuels and what we can do about it. And I would say that right at this moment, um, if we could apply as much pressure as possible to stop any new drilling for oil and gas, that would be my number one effort. That is an admirable and absolutely amazing effort because, yeah, it, there's been so much. I mean, my favorite greenwashing in the world is natural gas. Whoever came up with that, boy, brilliant, evil. Mm -hmm. So, and we don't recognize how much that impacts. We're not even talking about in the burning, um, how much it impacts our water systems and our soil systems and our air. Right. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your time and your songs. And, and all your... of the lessons that I've now learned. <laughs> well, this has been a great pleasure for me. Oh, uh, yay. Really, I've been delighted to be a part of this. And thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining Subject to Change, a sustainability podcast. All right. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, I guess fair wins. <laughs> Indeed, fair winds. Fair winds to all. Like and subscribe and check out the text with this video to connect to all of the resources. Be well.